So today what we're going to do are two things. First, the very boring business of how Lewis came to write these books. Secondly, we're going to get into The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, which you, if you haven't read, you've at least seen the movie. And of all the films, it's the only one that really stands up anywhere near. Don't go see Prince Caspian. It's a Disney version with a lot of romantic songs that just don't fit, um, and, and so you stay away from that. But your assignment for next week is to read Prince Caspian uh, there. Now, when Lewis was in his 40s, in the, kind of the late 1940s after the war, he felt that his whole talent of being a writer had ended. All of my writing, he says, has waned, and there is nothing left. My powers are gone. He was preoccupied with the health of Mrs. Moore, uh, who was the woman with whom he lived, and his brother at the Kilns. And uh, his good friend Charles Williams, who wrote a lot of supernatural thrillers, had just died. And so he was just exhausted and tired. The war was over, and he thought his writing was over. What he didn't realize was this was going to be one of the most fertile times of his life. He was going to be putting, at the lowest point of his life, suddenly things began to open up for him. And I think most of us find that when we have no expectation of what's going on, we find that God comes in and begins to do other things there. Mere Christianity was to appear in 1952. And what I'm going to do today, too, is show you how Mere Christianity and The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe are basically the same book. But one is written to adults and the other is written to children. Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe is written to adults. Okay, so we've got to put that out. Now, he was very critical of kind of the people who said that being an adult is a term of approval instead of really a descriptive term. He says, anyone that's concerned about being an adult cannot be an adult themselves. To be concerned about being grown up, to admire the grown up because it is grown up, to blush at the suspicion of being called childish, these are marks of childhood and adolescence. Young childhood and adolescence are healthy symptoms, but young things ought to want to grow. But to carry into middle life and old life this idea of being mature is really a mark of arrested development. <laughs> to think that you can be more grown up than you are. He said, when I was 10, I read fairy tales in secret, and I would have been ashamed if I had been found out reading them. Now that I am 50, I read them openly. When I became a man, I put away childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up. He says we often lose things as we grow older. And so this is kind of a modern conception, a false conception of growth. Uh, for example, when he was a child, he liked lemon squash. But when he became a man, he loved wine. And he said, now, if I had to give up lemon squash and just enjoy wine, I would have lost something. I would not have grown, I would have changed. He says, a tree grows by adding rings to it. A train changes from one station to another, leaving things behind. We do not need to leave behind those things that we have enjoyed as children. He says, now I enjoy both lemon squash and wine. I enjoy fairy tales and Jane Austen and Trollope. I enjoy all kinds of things and I add to myself rather than saying, now I've got to move to a more mature or sophisticated stage. He says, of course, those people who think that growing older is a sign of recognition and praise have to realize that if we follow that logically, we would come to the place where the word senile would be a sign of approval. <laughs> Why are we not to be congratulated on losing our teeth and our hair and our minds? He says, we want to keep on as much as we can and add to the trees that we are. And hopefully, by the end, some of us are very large trees. Now, he says, basically, too, fairy tales are important because they take us into an area of our experience. They, they resonate with us, and, and they open up our imaginations. We do not despise real woods because we have read of enchanted woods. What happens is every time we see a real wood, once we've read about enchanted woods, that wood becomes even more enchanted. We begin to see creatures in different ways. In fact, if you look around, you might see fellow fawns, 
you might see dwarfs. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, small dwarfs, here we are. Uh, you, you might see giants. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it is like that, uh, yeah, hobbits. We are hobbits. We really are large, furry feet, and we eat several times a day. Um, that is there. Second breakfast. Second breakfast, always going. But fairy tales have an important part. Now, he says, um, what the editor asked me to kind of explain how he came about to write The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. He says, I, I'm going to try, but he says, I don't want you to believe me because it's really hard for a writer to explain what he is or she is going through when you're writing because a man or a woman writing a story is too excited about the story itself to sit back and to think about what's actually going on. In fact, that might stop the work altogether. Just as if you start thinking about how to tie your tie, the next thing you find out is you can't tie it. There are things that if you think about too much, they will not kind of flow through you. And afterwards, when the story is finished, he said, I've forgotten a great deal of what writing it was like. But one thing he was sure of, he says, all my seven Narnia books and his science fiction trilogy all began with seeing pictures in my head. At first, there was no story, just pictures. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe began when Lewis was about 16 years old. He said, I have a picture of a fawn carrying an umbrella and packages on a snowy wood. I have no idea what that was, but that image happened to him when he was a teenager. Other images began to intrude over time. He saw this picture of a lamppost just standing by itself. He saw a queen on a sledge and a magnificent lion. And then one day when he was about 50, he said, let's try to make a story out of all these images. Let's follow the images and see where they go. He would argue that writing is less like building a house where you plan everything, you get the engineers, you get the blueprints. He said it's more like planting a garden or watching a bird. You never know what's going to happen next. You do your little bits and suddenly things begin to grow. Now at the time he said he had very little idea about how the story would go. He had this fawn out there in the woods. But then suddenly Aslan came bounding into this. He said I think I'd been having a good many dreams about lions about that time. Apart from that, I don't know where the lion came from or why he came in. But once he was there, he pulled the whole story together, and soon he pulled the other six Narnian tales together. Aslan, he explained in a letter to a little girl named Anne, was a lion because Christ is called the Lion of Judah, and the lion is the king of the beasts. He had also been reading a lot of literature like Spencer's The Fairy Queen. And if you've read The Fairy Queen, it's amazing because you have this wonderful, great lion that protects everyone. He had also read Charles Williams' very scary spiritual thriller called The Place of the Lion. And so all of these things were coming together. He also was aware, too, from reading uh, on the Tales of Aladdin that the Turkish word for lion is Aslan. So Aslan comes from this kind of Turkish word. And he said... At first, there was nothing, anything Christian about these stories. They were just pictures. He just said, I'm going to follow pictures. And the element of the Christian faith came in later. Now, he says, the problem with much religious instruction is that it paralyzes the imagination. One is told how one should feel about God or about suffering or about grace. You're told how to feel. This is your proper response. He says, I want to revive an encounter with God something other than just dry propositional teaching. And said, the purpose of an educator is more to irrigate deserts than to cut down jungles. It is more important to irrigate the deserts of your children's imagination and your grandchildren than to kind of say, no, don't do this, do that. These are things you must do. In fact, it's really, Lewis points out there's a difference between the way that parents tell stories and the way that grandparents tell stories. Parents say, now, don't talk to strangers. Don't go in the woods alone. Okay, be kind to strangers, but don't talk to them. Okay? <laughs> Parents give instruction. They are very careful about the kinds of stories. Grandparents are a little wilder. They say, when your father was a kid, you begin to tell the stories that you find in the Bible and in Shakespeare. Suddenly, the parents are not as noble and good and pious and righteous as you thought. 
you begin to see there's some naughty bits in the past of your parents. And it's a very healthy thing to kind of let these people come out. So he says, you see, in a sense, I know very little about how this story was born. That is, I don't know where the pictures come from. I don't believe anyone knows exactly how he or she makes something up. Making up is a very mysterious thing. When you have an idea, could you tell anybody how you actually thought of it? Now, the origin of the name Narnia is fairly uncertain. There was a kind of an, an ancient Roman city about 299 B.C. called Nequenium, and the Ro conquering Romans renamed it Narnia. Uh, and Lewis had studied classics, and in fact, one of his letters to a friend, Arthur Greaves, he wrote about the, the Pliny the Younger and his letters. And Pliny the Younger refers to a villa owned by his mother-in-law, and that place is Narnia. And so there's this kind of pleasant place that's out in the country, away from everything else in Rome, and there's something he says very pleasant about it, even though his mother-in-law was there. <laughs> okay. There is also the possibility that Lewis, who studied medieval literature, was aware of a reference to Lucia von Narnia, Lucy of Narnia, in a 1501 German text, Wunderlich, Gerstecken, so on. It's the wondrous stories of monastic women. And as a bachelor, he was very interested in the wonderful stories of monastic women. So he wrote these books. They came out one a year. I mean, he just kind of would sit down and, and flow through them. He was also writing what he called his Oxford History of English Literature. It is probably the foremost kind of authority text, authoritative text on English literature of the 16th century. And uh, its acronym is Oxford History of English Literature. Oh, hell. And he would always talk to me, he says, basically, when is this going to be over? Oh, hell. You know, it's just taking forever uh, that is there. And he also began writing his own spiritual autobiography, Surprised by Joy, and how God kind of worked into his, way, his life in ways that he never expected. Now, before he had begun that, as a child, he lived with his nurse, his nanny, Lizzie Endicott, who will come into the stories. She told him all kinds of Irish tales, as I'm sure Wynne and Kathy do now. In every sermon, you're going to hear about Ireland and Scotland over and over again. But that's good. Scotland, Scotland especially. You didn't go to Ireland. Okay, Scotland. But she would talk about leprechauns and pots of gold and travel to mystic islands. And so he and his brother created this little land called Boxen. And Boxen he had populated with talking animals. But they were just like real politicians and statespeople. It was a very boring book. You can still get it, but it's not worth reading at all. But he was practicing. He would also sit in his parents' wardrobe and tell stories to his cousins. And so this nursery was a wonderful place to remember. Another person that he read early on who influenced him significantly was Edith Nesbitt. Edith Nesbitt had stories of the Bastable children, brothers and sisters, who created kind of stories. And they went through a train station to find an enchanted world. Who else has gone through a train station to find an enchanted world? So we find, kind of going back to, to Rowling's kind of Harry Potter stuff, all of this is kind of interconnected. And the place they went to was called the Big Wardrobe in Spare Room. And so Lewis is, is in fact, he says, I am not original. I have plagiarized everything. <laughs> you know, you can find what I think. And, and he encourages that. Uh, to kind of find that there. He was also influenced by Francis Burnett's The Secret Garden. And you remember The Secret Garden is where a little girl goes in and the garden has, has just gone to pieces. And yet she comes in and with love that garden is restored. And so when the children go into Narnia and it's winter, it is like that secret garden and you're hoping for something to come out. He would also play in his Belfast home at Little Leah. He would go play hide and go seek. Um, he dedicated the book to his godchild, Lucy Barfield. Uh, Owen Barfield was a man with whom he disagreed violently, but he was one of his best friends. Uh, he was a theosophist, and, and so he and Lewis had this great debate, this great war back and forth about ideas. But it shows that you need friends with whom you disagree. You need those friends that you can kind of sharpen your mind and play it, and yet they were so close, and so Lucy... Owen Barfield's daughter becomes the dedicated person. Now, Owen Barfield's wife was much more practical, uh, Maud, and she was very concerned when Lewis talked about children 
going through a wardrobe into a magic land. And she said, I am afraid they will accidentally lock themselves in a wardrobe. So when you read this book, you will find Lewis puts in five cautionary notes about not closing wardrobe doors. <laughs> Let me read just two of them, okay, right at the beginning. So she goes into the wardrobe, and it's kind of like a branches of trees, all these coats. And uh, a moment later, she finds she's standing in the middle of woods. And uh, give me a second. She found that she was standing there, and she was excited, and she looked back over her shoulder. And she could catch a glimpse of the empty room from which she had set out. She had, of course, left the door open, for she knew that it would be a very silly thing to shut oneself in a wardrobe. <laughs> Lewis brings that in five times in the first two chapters. He said, Maud, are you satisfied now? Okay, because we don't want them to be lost in there. So you have the story of these four children coming to live with an old professor. And it's during the air raids in England, during the great blitzkrieg, that, uh, not blitzkrieg, the kind of the, the bombing of England, London we have, and Lewis and his brother Warney took in these four girls on September 2nd, 1939. They had been evacuated from London because of the air raids. And he found them to be very nice, unaffected creatures, and delighted with their surroundings at the kilns but always wanting to know what they could do next. He would be in writing something, and they would come in and say, what can we do now? What can we do now? And he, of course he wanted to slap them upside the head, but he was much more gracious than that. They jumped over joy when war was finally declared. He remembers these four girls running around the house just excited that something was going to happen at this boring place called the Kilns. There was also this one remarkable young woman who would come and live with him called Jill Fluitt. And she was a, a devout Roman Catholic, and she becomes the model for Lucy that we see later on. Now, Lewis had, had considered writing a book for these children when they were living with him as evacuees, but because they showed curiosity towards the wardrobe, towards everything else he was doing. And so he began to kind of play with names, and the original names were Anne, Martin, Rose, and Peter. And Peter is the youngest. But you know he changes all of those to Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. Peter's name will become very significant for Lewis because when in the last battle Aslan commands Peter the High King to shut the door on a dark cold space that had once been the old Narnia, Peter pulls the doors closed and he locks it with a golden key. A gesture that calls to mind what? Peter was given the keys of the kingdom. And it is he who kind of accepts and rejects it in one sense. And so that's why we have this whole myth, this story of, of Peter at the gate, St. Peter, all the Roman Catholic jokes about St. Peter. But Peter has the keys here, and he does there as well. Now, Tolkien took so long to write his Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. He was very careful about the language, about the, the topography, about everything and the characters. And, and basically, he really did not like what Lewis was doing. And he said, how can you write for children? Because Lewis, as a bachelor, had no children. In fact, he was quite uncomfortable around them. But perhaps as one biographer said, he wrote the chronicles for the child who was within himself. Lewis may have agreed because in another letter to a little child called Philidia, he said, I don't think age matters so much as people think. Parts of me are still 12 years old. And I think other parts were already 50 when I was 12. So he writes for children and the child within himself. Now, there are a lot of little bits for adults that are not for children that go over their minds, which is fine. And there are things that he is going to kind of entertain us with if we pay attention to the text. One of the first things he says in the first page, he said, there were three servants, Ivy, Margaret, and Betty, but they don't come into the story much. It's a British understatement. They don't come into the story at all. That's the only time we hear of them as he's played. He is a narrator who will often come out of the story and begin to kind of interact with his reader. He will say, for example, that there was a giant with a happy beaming face, and that is a sight well worth seeing, since giants of any sort are now so rare in England. So he plays with us back and forth. Now, 
One of my favorite parts for adults happens um, when Lucy discovers Narnia. She has gone in and she meets whom? Mr. Tumnus, the fawn. Okay, this little fawn, kind of a satyr, and usually they're kind of wild little creatures. She goes into his library, and most people just skip through his library. And when you begin to read the titles that he talks about, he says, first, Men, Monks, and Gamekeepers, a study in popular legend. <laughs> Is man a myth? Thinking, are fawns, are Greek characters myths? So she's saying, Is man a myth? And then some of the better ones. The life and letters of Salinas. Salinas is that fat, drunken, jolly old man, probably an Episcopalian, who goes, who goes along with Dionysius. And they're always getting drunk. So you've got the story, the life and letters of this drunk, libidious old man who is a legend, everything else, and it's right there on the shelf. But then he also has nymphs and their ways. Here's Lewis the bachelor kind of playing with sex and saying, what are the waves of nymphs? How do they behave? How do they seduce us? Tolkien's response, well, he just went haywire. He said, how, Jack? It really won't do, you know. I mean to say, nymphs and their ways, the love life of a fawn. Do you know what you're talking about? <laughs> and, and so he's sure that children would kind of get this. But Lewis, Tolkien's response almost discouraged Lewis from publishing uh, th this whole book. He had scathing criticism. He says, not only is it a failure, but it is beyond saving. He thought it was too hastily written, and it included a mix of too many myths. You have Father Christmas, you have Greek fawns, you have British children, you have evil queens from Denmark, you have Norse wolves. All of these things just mix too much. But Lewis just kind of exploded with it and let it go. He didn't go back and rewrite it. He was happy with what he had written. And Tolkien, being so meticulous, was, was just frustrated with his friend. Now, one of the most significant works that influenced Lewis, his imagination, was George MacDonald's Fantasties. He had picked up at a kiosk at a railroad station when he was about 17. And he says, this, he wasn't a Christian, he was an atheist until he was about 31, as you know. And he said, but it baptized my imagination. It made me realize that there's something else out there. The hero, whose name is Anidos, Anidos basically means one who has lost his way, became someone that Lewis was identified with. Anidos had lost his mother when he was a child, as Lewis had. And reading the fairy tale one night, he wishes he could travel to an enchanted wood, and Anidos' wish comes true. There he meets a beautiful young woman, the maid of the alders. She is pale and cold like marble. She invites Anidos into her cave, like Tumnus invites Lucy, where she lights a lamp and lulls him to sleep, planning to betray him. She is a daughter of Lilith. Lilith is the first wife of Adam, according to Jewish folktales, and she's the mistress of the devil. And so she's a menace to children and to others. And so we see the maid of alders, this tree. In fact, it's a really kind of creepy thing when you read it, because I remember reading it in seminary the first time. I had read that Lewis liked so I said, oh, I'll read it. And so I stayed up all night, and, and when Anidos is taken into this wood by this beautiful woman, you're thinking, you know, as a seminarian, oh, this is great. Uh, you know, this woman has invited me into her lair, and, you know, we're going to see. And then they go in there, and, and they, they make love, and it's just, you're going, wow, your imagination is in seminary, is going wild. But <laughs> as, as you begin to kind of realize, you turn the pages, and suddenly when he wakes up in the morning, she is bark. She is a tree. She's an alder tree. And suddenly, you're, you're kind of awake. And I think many of us had dates we remember like that. You, you know, you just you wonder, what's gone on here? This, I'm, I'm with a tree or a stump or whatever. Okay. But he, he found all these kind of Jungian archetypes in the witch. And uh, not only was she very much like the Maid of Alder, but also Hans Christian Andersen's The Snow Queen, this very cold, pale beauty. And the archetypal Circe, from the Odyssey. You remember, the siren who was able to hypnotize men with her delicious singing and her tempted them with food and turned them into animals. Of course, many women will always say you don't have to turn men into animals because they already are. But here you have the witch in the Hansel and Gretel and the wicked witch of the West. All of these come together. The one last character here is the ferocious captain of the secret police. Now remember, we had just come through World War II and so the SS was very clear on his mind. And he goes back to the Norse myths, which had really kind of informed much of Nazi ideology. 
And the wolf is Fenis Ulf, and he's drawn from the monster child of Loki. And his line throughout is, I hear and obey. I hear and obey. Now, this, in one sense, someone said that basically he is a Islamic phobic. His kind of representation of Islam, um, we'll get to later on, is kind of very negative. But when he takes this word, I hear and obey, I will kill if I need to. I will do what I need to do if I find that the queen has told me to do. You can see this kind of jihad idea. But Lewis said, the where I got this phrase from and this idea was from the Arabian tales of A Thousand and One Nights. That's something that the characters say in there over and over again and then justify that this is what they are called to do, I hear and obey. So it's kind of a, for the radical fringe, you find this kind of word, I hear and obey, I do not think. Now, there are three quick themes I'd, I'd like to talk about um, in this book. One is temptation. We see that Edmund is tempted when he first meets the whoosh, and she gives him what? Chocolate. Turkish delight. Chocolate for Americans, yeah. I, I think Turkish delight is awful. It's a sticky kind of gummy thing. I just, I hate it. But chocolate, it could tempt me. Okay, there. Um, you, you kind of remember Dorian Gray. I can resist everything except temptation. And the only way to get rid of temptation is to yield to it. And so this is what Edmund does. Edmund gets into that. There was a really interesting thesis called Nothing More Delicious, Food as Temptation in Children's Literature by Mary Stevens. And she points out how in many, many books, like Hansel and Gretel, Alice in Wonderland, uh, Roald Dahl's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Neil Gaiman's Coraline, all of these use food as temptation for child protagonists. And it's very necessary because it teaches them how to overcome this most basic temptation. Later on in life, it's going to be sex or alcohol, fame, power, money, all of these other things. And we learn as children how to relate to food as kind of a symbol for what's going to come to us later on. And so it, it's really kind of wise the way she puts that. The problem, too, for Edmund is giving into one temptation leads to others. Edmund's obsession for Turkish delight leads him to lie and to be cruel. It takes him even into worse sins as we see it. So we find that all of us have in our lives these things that we call precious, like Tolkien would tell us. And nobody, Lewis says, know how bad he is until he has tried very hard to be good. You find out when you're trying to be good that you don't have the strength and you need the Holy Spirit. It's a simple lesson that we learn over and over again. Only the man who yields to temptation doesn't realize how strong it can be. It is much harder to be good. So he takes us there through temptation. And remember Mae West, between two temptations, I always pick the one I've never tried before. <laughs> but even, I mean, I, I think her more, more insightful line is, when women go wrong, men go right after them. <laughs> okay, okay. But also, Lewis kind of points out, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. And so when Edmund is brought before Aslan, we find that he is forgiven and restored. And this is, I think, the importance, one of the things of coming to worship every week, to read the, the prayer of confession, to, to receive that. The one thing the Roman Catholics have that we don't have enough of is confession to a priest. Uh, but we're all priests, and so we should be able to confess to one another. If we find that we cannot overcome an addiction, it's important to talk to others and, and have that kind of sharing. And so you get that sense of community there. The second theme of language in the wardrobe is truth. And truth is very important for Lewis. And I just want to give you one example uh, from the two books. In Mere Christianity, he has his most famous argument about this kind of trilemma of who Jesus is. He says, I'm trying here to prevent you from saying the really silly thing that people say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing you shouldn't say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would be, wouldn't be a great moral teacher. He'd either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg <laughs> or the devil of hell. Of course, you can take the line of saying that he didn't say these things, but his followers invented them. But that's only shifting the difficulty. These people were Jews, too. The last thing they would do would invent some kind of idea. The people who never said anything like this about Moses or Elijah. 
This theory only saddles you with 12 inexplicable lunatics instead of one. So we can't get out of it that way. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him, kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But don't come to him with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He hasn't left that open to us. He didn't intend to. Now that is one of the kind of the core arguments on the divinity of Christ that he has in mere Christianity. <clears throat> he does the same thing in Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. If you remember, Lucy has gone into Narnia, and she's come out and told everybody about where she's been. Edmund has gone in, but then denied that he's ever been in there. And so the older siblings, Peter and Susan, are worried about their little sister. And so they decide to go to the professor, which is always a wise thing to do. No. <laughs> okay. And he said, uh, we're afraid about our little sister. And the professor says, how do you know your sister's story is not true? But oh, began Susan, and then stopped. Anyone could see from the old man's face that he was perfectly serious. Then Susan pulled herself together and said, but Edmund said they'd only been pretending. That is a point, said the professor, which certainly deserves consideration. For instance, if you excuse me for asking the question, does your experience lead you to regard your brother or your sister as the more reliable? I mean, which is the more truthful? That's just the funny thing about it, sir, said Peter. Up until now, I would have said Lucy every time. Well, what do you think, my dear, said the professor to Susan. Well, in general, I'd say the same as Peter. But this couldn't be true. All it's about this magic wood and the fawn. That's more than I know, said the professor. And a charge of lying against someone with whom you've always found truthful is a very serious thing. A very serious thing indeed. Well, we were afraid it might be something else than lying, said Susan. We were afraid there might be something wrong with Lucy. Madness, you mean, said the professor. Oh, you can make your mind shoot easy about that. One has only to look at her and talk to her to see that she is not mad. But then, Susan stopped, she had never dreamed that a grown-up would talk like the professor, and she didn't know what to think. Logic, said the professor to himself. Why don't they teach logic at these schools? There are only three possibilities. Either your sister is telling lies, or she is mad, or she is telling the truth. You know she doesn't tell lies, and it's obvious she isn't mad. For the moment then, and unless any further evidence turns up, we must assume that she is telling the truth. You see how both books have the same options, and Lewis kind of communicates them in the same way. Lastly then, we get to the theme of transformation. Characters are changed. And again, we find in mere Christianity, Lewis writing about the change that will come over us. And he makes a distinction between biological life, basically just existing, and spiritual or zoe life, which is full of abundance. The biological sort, which comes to us through nature, which like everything else in nature, is always tending to run down and decay, can only be kept up by insistent subsidies from nature. The spiritual life, which is in God from all eternity, and which has made the whole natural universe, is zoe. Bios has, to be sure, a certain shadowy or symbolic resemblance to Zoe, but only the sort of resemblance there is between a photo and a place or between a statue and a man. A man who has changed from being Bios to Zoe would have gone through as big a change as a statue which has changed from being a carved stone to being a real man. And this is precisely what Christianity is all about. This world is a great sculptor's shop. We are the statues, and there is a rumor going around the shop that some of, some of us someday are going to come to life. Then, in Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, chapter 16, they come into all the statues in the queen's castle. And then Aslan comes and he breathes on them. And she looks at one of the lions that he breathes on. And Susan says, look, look at the lion. I expect you've seen someone put a lighted match to a bit of newspaper, which is propped up in a grate against an unlit fire. And for a second, nothing seems to happen. And then you notice a tiny streak of flame creeping along the edge of the newspaper. It was like that now, 
For a second after Aslan had breathed upon him, the stone lion looked just the same. Then a tiny streak of gold began to run along his white marble back. Then it spread. Then the color seemed to lick all over him as the flame licks all over a piece of paper. Then, while his hindquarters were still obviously stone, the lion shook his mane and all the heavy stony folds rippled into living hair. Then he opened a great red mouth, warm and living, and gave a prodigious yawn. And now his hind legs had come to life. He lifted one of them and scratched himself. Then, having caught sight of Aslan, he went bounding after him and frisking round him. And he goes on, and as Aslan breathes on all of these statues, you find they all slowly come to life. And instead of the deadly silence of all these statues, the place rang with the sound of happy roarings, brains, yelpings, barkings, squealings, cooings, neighings, stompings, shouts, hurrahs, songs, and laughter. This is what the transformation of the church is, that we all come in as statues almost every week. And when the word of God kind of breathes upon us, suddenly we come to life slowly. And this is where Lewis brings these two worlds together, that he is, transforms us. I close with one last story that Lewis gives. Um, and he talks about the Celtic lore of the white stag. Remember the white stag at the end of the book. Now, what is the story behind this Celtic lore? If you catch the white stag, the stag will give you one wish. The problem is, the poor cottager, Sean Kiley, had caught him, and he realized he only had one wish. But Sean's barren wife wanted to become pregnant. His blind mother wanted her eyesight restored. His impoverished father wanted some financial security. And so this young husband and son went to the stag the next day and made his one wish that Sean's mother could gaze upon his newborn son rocking in a cradle of gold. Okay. So we come with this one wish, and the one wish can be something that sums up all of our needs. And this is where Lewis takes us, basically to the stag at the end, where we now are given a wish to see things that we've never seen before and to enter Narnia. Next week, we go and visit Prince Caspian. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we have time for questions or observations or memories. Um, I want you to read Procrastinian. Yes, please. Uh, regarding Kirk, is that the same Kirk as Judea Rose and the Witches and the Nephew? Yes, it is. Very good. Kirk is basically referring to um, this great professor called Kirk. Uh, professor Kirk. The great Kirk was Lewis's tutor when he was growing up. He had an atheist Scottish tutor who was Kirk, the great Kirk, the great knock, he called him. And uh, so this becomes the professor who ba basically leads the children. But he is also Diggory and the magician's nephew. So when we get to there, we'll focus on him. Good question. One. Lewis was wounded in World War II. One. World War I. But he never, ever says a word about anything that happened in World War I. Can you explain anything further? Well, my father was in World War II in Korea. And there's something about that great generation that did not talk about the war then. There's something, I think, that is so traumatic that you don't deal with it. Now, he does a little bit. He, several places in other parts, he talks about how in the trenches, uh, the, the worst thing was the, the wet, the cold, being in the kind of these ditches you, you dug yourself into. He said, you would sit around telling jokes, talking theology, debating things. And so he talked about the common life. He didn't talk as much about his war experience. He was brave. Uh, a whole company of Germans surrendered to him. They just came forward with their hands up. <laughs> and so he became a hero. Uh, he was wounded and put in the hospital, and that's where he started reading G.K. Chesterton. But he, he stays away from that, uh, the war, both Tolkien and Lewis. But you can see Tolkien's war in, in the battles with the orcs, these kind of unnameless forces that are coming at you. Tolkien, kind of, both through their literature, they, they dealt more with their war experience than directly talking about it. But it was, I think it was very traumatic for both of them. He lost his best friends, three friends in, in one ditch, Patty Moore being one of them. So it was something you just kind of, I want to move on. Uh, you're probably going to address this later on, but <clears throat> I, um, you, you uh, did a reference to the Islamophobia that, that, that was exhibited. But there was something oddly prescient at the same time. Um, and uh, I, I'm wondering if he 
didn't see, and maybe maybe looking not uh, not necessarily as a religion but as a culture, something vulnerable there uh, in in his uh, portrayal of uh, or, or uh, uh, hints yes. of, of some of the realities that we're seeing today. I, I think so. We get to the horse and his boy. It's basically all about the Islamic culture right. and the Arabian culture. You get a sense there. But he also, in the last battle, has a kind of a, a Muslim who is saved, right. Emeth, whose name right. means truth, and he has always been seeking the true God. Right. And so he's worshipped only what he has known, which has been Tash, this kind of other warlike God, right. and saying, no, this is really what I'm looking for. So he allows, I think, just the openness of the culture. But yeah, I think he was prescient in many things, yeah. both he and Tolkien recognizing some of the dangers. Thank you. What are you, what are you going to read next week? Good job. Good class. Okay.